Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. My ruins resurrected. God, this is the end. You can't tell me you can make the dead in me come back to life. Everything turns to ashes, but without the hope of revival. Imagine living with faith in God. I can't. Get back on my feet. I stumble and fall, but I am too weak to make it on my own. So my only option is surrender. I throw my hands in the air. I give up. I ruin everything I touch. It's foolish to think that God can restore my life. Wait, God can restore my life. It's foolish to think that I've ruined everything I touch. I give up. I throw my hands in the air. Surrender is my only option. I'm too weak to make it on my own, so I stumble and fall. But get back on my feet with faith in God. I can't imagine living without the hope of revival. Everything turns to ashes, but you can make the dead in me come back to life. You can't tell me this is the end. God resurrected my ruins. Good morning. Happy Easter. Glad to have you with us. Uh, if you're online, we're glad that you're joining with us as well. You know, Jesus is risen. That is what we celebrate on Easter. And it is a little odd, you know, that it's April Fool's Day on Easter. <clears throat> I was thinking about it. I was going, I don't remember that ever happening before. So I had to get, on, get online, you know, Google it and say, when's the last time it's happened? It's been 62 years since the last time. I mean, just because the winter solace is all that stuff that happens, you know. So, it's, you know. I guess we're supposed to prank each other, you right? As Jacob was saying, Jesus pranked, uh, pranked people who thought he was dead. I come from a home, actually, where we used to prank each other quite a bit, certainly on my mom's side, and, and uh, so I'm no stranger to that. I assume you, uh, there's, uh, how many of you guys like pranks, to play pranks on others? <laughs> it's different, huh? Uh, you know what, I, the prank I like least, I've discovered, is when I accidentally prank myself and I kind of look like an idiot. That's the one I think, like, wow, that one's, you know, makes me feel stupid, you know, I feel foolish. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I was flying with my wife to Arizona. My mom had turned 80, and we were going to uh, celebrate her birthday with her. So, uh, you know, this, some, this winter, there's been a fair amount of sickness going around. So I was thinking, well, you know, people get sick on planes, and, uh, and, I just think, you know, claustrophobia, all that stuff, you're in there. So I, I decided to take some airborne. I thought, you know, that stuff might help. You know, it's got supercharged vitamin C and, and just chewable, so they're easy. So I threw some in my bag and, and my, my carry-on bag. So I get on the plane. It's an early flight, so I'm not really there. You know, I'm just kind of like going through the motions. I get on the flight. I'm about to put my stuff up in there in the, in the overhead bin. Uh, Sharon's already taken her seat. She's in the middle seat. And, uh, and so I take two airborne, I throw them in my mouth, and I throw myself up there, and all of a sudden, I re something's going on. There's like a reaction in my mouth. It's just start, it starts like coming out of my mouth, and foam <laughs> is coming out of my mouth. I don't know if you know, but evidently, airborne has two different types. They have chewables, and then they have the kind of the plop, plop, fizz, fizz ones. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> I had grabbed the wrong one, so it's like coming out. And I'm like, my eyeballs, I'm, I'm so tired, I don't even know what's going on at first. And people are looking at me like, what in the world? And Sharon's looking up at me like, oh, my goodness. You know, <laughs> and, I, and I don't know what to do, you know, because you're on a plane, and, and it starts foaming out of my mouth. So kind of in a moment of desperation, you know, there's, they have those magazines behind the seat. So I grab a magazine, and I just spit all of the foam and all the stuff in there. And then I look around. Everybody's like, oh, do we have to sit next to this guy? You know, what is, <laughs> what is wrong with him? You know, I felt so dumb, you know, so foolish. Like, just let me, see. let me just hide and try to, you know, get to the next flight. Now, here's a word of advice. Don't do that, okay? 
You know, you don't want to act like a fool. And, you know, that advice has been passed down for years. Uh, look at the top of your outline, the very first verse. Uh, that's, that's God's advice to us. He says, he says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. He goes, but be like the wise. So on April Fool's Day, Easter 2018, we're going to look at a story that Jesus tells. And it's about somebody who acts foolish. And obviously the point of that is, is how, you can, how you can be wise, how you don't have to stay in a place where you're doing st dumb stuff, where you're, you know, you just feel bad and it just nothing good is coming from it. And what Jesus does is when he tells this story, he really tells us a lot about God. Because sometimes when we're doing dumb stuff, we're kind of like the fool. And how does God act? Now, we know how other people act a lot of times when we act like fools, right? They can, you know, you, you say something dumb online and watch how people, you know, come at you and all. But how does God act when we, when we act foolish? Well, that's what this story is about. So I want you to follow along with me. It's quite an interesting story that Jesus tells uh, to the, the 2,000 years ago, to the culture he's in. And it's a story about two sons and their father. Here's where it's, in, it's found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and we're going to pick it up here in verse 10. He says, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, this is a spoiler alert, because this is where he's going. It's really a story about somebody who's a sinner, foolish, and he decides to become wise. He says, I'm going to repent. I'm going to do things differently. So going on, he says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between him. So this story, he's telling, Jesus is telling, he says, there's two sons and there's a father. And he's, and he's saying, this is what it is like in the kingdom of heaven. This is, this is God and this is us. You know, sometimes we don't act always too smart. And so he says, and he sets it up saying, this is what God is like. And he says that the son goes up and says, hey, I want, I, I want out of here. I'm living in this home. I, I want out of Dodge. And, it, you know, evidently this son is just, he's just done. He's tired. He's tired of living by the family rules. He was tired of all of the obligations in the family. Maybe he was tired of the dead. Who knows? He just wanted out of there. And he says, I, I'm, I'm, I just want a, a way for my problems. I've got all these problems. You know, there's people today that have a lot of problems, and maybe, you're some, maybe you've got problems, and you just want out of there. And sometimes when we're, our problems get so bad, we just look for any way out. How can I get away from my problems? I've got these marriage problems. I've got this problem with, you know, uh, with so-and-so, and we ditch it, and we leave only to find out that our problems follow us. See, we're told, and there's a lot of people that'll tell us that our problems are from without. It's the environment, it's your condition, it's all these other, it's your parents, but we soon discover that the mo most of our problems are within. They come with us, so no matter where we go, we can't run from our problems. This is what the son is trying to do. He's saying, hey, I want out of here, I want to run, and, uh, and I'm going to escape. And so his, he tries to make his move, and, uh, and, uh, and that's what he does, and so the father lets him go. You know, for some of you, maybe you, uh, years ago, you were close to God. And you've decided, you know, you were going to make your move. You were going to try to get your life. You were going to do something else with your life. And you left. Maybe you were raised in the church. But listen, if that's you, if you've said, hey, I, I used to know God. I used to have a close relationship with him, but I've left. The Bible says that once you've tasted the good things of God, the counterfeit just does not match it. And so no matter what, you end up being miserable. You're trying to find life. You're going after all of the old pleasures, the parties, the drugs, or the, the, the going for the corporate ladder and the money. And, but you find the emptiness is still there because ultimately it's found, it's found in relationship with God. Certainly this is part of what the story is about, where this kid, he, he thinks it's better out there. So he decides to leave. So he says to his father, he goes, I want my part of the estate. And really what he's saying is, is I want my inheritance. You see, in that culture, when you were, what he's really saying is, is I wish you were dead. Because that's what they had. That was their family inheritance. It was their estate. It was the flocks. It was the, it was the, uh, the land. And, and, and that's a big deal. Now, for us today to sell some land and say, hey, you know, 
I want to sell a house. That's no big deal, right? We sell houses and move like tumbleweeds sometimes, right? Just, I want a house here. I want to, I want to move to Florida. And, but in those days, that's not how it was. In those days, it was, it, was, it was a sacred trust. It was passed down. If you understand anything about like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that's still going on today in the Middle East, it's over land. Not just land, but land as a sacred trust passed down from God through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way to them. And this is the way they feel. This is why that, that, that's so uh, contested over there for so many years. And this is what's going on here with this, with this, uh, this situation Jesus is describing. So the son saying, you know, I just, I want half of, my, of your estate. I, I want my portion, whatever it would be. And I'm, and I'm going to leave. This would have shocked the audience of his day, just like, oh my goodness. I mean, that, that, that's a huge betrayal against the family. Not just saying, hey, I want my inheritance, but I don't care anything about uh, the sacred trust. Also in those days, that was their social security. So now he's gonna, not going to have any social security. Now, we're probably not going to have any social security either, right? <laughs> but at that day, that was what it was. It was the, you know, when they got older, it was whatever, you know, the flocks on the land were worth, and that was their social security. He goes, I don't, need, I don't care about your future either. I, it's all about me. I want out of here. And this shows, this story goes on to show the, uh, the incredible patience that the father has towards this kid. Because notice what happens here. And that's number two is God is a patient father. God waits, waits patiently for us. Now, God demonstrates his patience by allowing us sometimes just to come to our own rope. He, in, in his patience, he allows the kid to go because he knows you know, that that's a dead end. And this is, notice what the Bible says. It says, don't you realize how kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? How do we know that? He goes, or, he goes, or don't you care? He goes, can't you see how kind he has been in giving you time to turn from your sin? You know, sometimes God's kindness and his waiting on us and letting us come to the end of our rope is demonstration of his love for us, his kindness, and his patience. He's, he's waiting on us. He's going, I know that some, that's a painful route. That's not my best for you. But if that's what you're choosing in God's patience, he goes, I know that'll eventually draw you back. Because what ends up, what ends up happening is we start to see the real results of sin. Sin has three characteristics that we see in, in, in this story. Number one, in verse 13, we see that sin is selfish. It says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. See, no thoughts about other people. It's sin is selfish. It's all about me. I don't care about how my decisions will affect my children or will affect my spouse or will affect uh, my life or my health. It's just, it's, I need my needs met, and that's all that matters. And this is what was going on with this boy, and this is what happens every time. We start to be tempted with sin. Really, it comes down to, I don't care about what's going to happen to others. And here's the truth, is that sin always affects other people. We do not live in a vacuum. We always, when we make poor decisions, when we act foolish, it affects other people. Always. And this is what happens here. The Proverbs fourteen twelve says, there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. And so selfishness certainly ends up just coming back on us. It, it, it's a dead end street. And so that's what this kid does. He goes to a far country. He's, he's, he doesn't care about what's, how it affects other people. Second thing we see, sin is expensive. It's expensive to sin. He says after... Uh, he had spent everything there in verse 14. There was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Sin is expensive business. It, it costs us our relationships. It costs us our health. It costs us our legacy. It costs us our memories, all kinds of things, our time. It may be, sin might be cheap, but it's not inexpensive. And then number three is that sin is degrading. It's degrading versus 15 and 16, continuing in the story, it says, so he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him out to his farm to take care of the pigs. He wished he could fill himself with the bean pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything to eat. To eat. So now here Christ sets this picture of degradation because here's this, this kid 
he's a Jewish kid and he's working in this pig farm. It's like, what's this, you know, a, a nice Jewish kid like you working in a place like that? Now, he's working uh, in a Gentile pig farm. You go, how do you know it's a Gentile? Because Jews would not have pigs. They didn't have Reformed Jews back then. And Jews wouldn't have pigs. They wouldn't have pig farms. And here he is. He's working in this pig farm. And uh, that's not a very nice place to work, you know, just in a pigsty. And he's longing after the food that they that they were eating. Now, he used to have all this money. Now he's, he's, he's at the end of his rope. He's thinking, man, look at those bean pods. Now, bean pods, there's two types of bean pods in those days. One was like a really good meal. I mean, it was succulent, delicious, sweet. Uh, it was nutritious. People liked them. There's an old proverb that said a kid, a boy that had a pocket full of bean pods was a lucky boy. This was not those bean pods. There's another type of bean pod that was on pretty much just fiber. It had no nutritional value. It was tasteless. And they said they would just throw them in buckets, throw them into the pigsty for the pigs to eat. And this kid's looking at those and going, oh, I want some. I'm sure he probably ate some of those pods. That's all he could get, you know, stealing from the pigs. And it's unsatisfying. The more he eats, the more unsatisfied he is. You know, this is the way sin is. The more we get and we think we'll be satisfied and we're not. Have you ever eaten something where you just go, that's not real satisfying? You know, a, a couple months ago, my, my wife and I, we were down in Mexico on the missions trip. We, we work in the colonias during the day, down in the poorest of the poor. Then we go and we back to our hotel, take a shower and, and rest. One of those days, we were real tired, and my son and my daughter-in-law that were there. And, and so we decided, let's get some cookies, you know, because, you know, carbs, right? And you're tired. And so we went out, and we got some cookies. Well, Mexican cookies are different than American cookies. They're, a lot of them aren't as sweet. I mean, we, me Americans have, like, this insane, you know, this huge sweet tooth, right? So we get some cookies, and we eat, like, a half of a sleeve. I was going to say a box, but it's not that bad, okay? Uh, half a sleeve. And then we're thinking, oh, man, every time we eat one, we, after a while, we're all going, well, I, I don't feel like I ate a cookie. You know, I mean, I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm satisfied. So we opened up another, a whole other different type of cookie. And we're eating those. Same experience. We're going, man, what, what's wrong with these cookies? You know, they're not, they're not satisfying us. They don't have the carbs. They don't have the sugar. Lastly, we open up a box of these cookies called chokies. Now, I think there's something there that is. So I, I don't think those would sell in America because the name, you know, Chokey. Hey, would, can I give your kid a Chokey? Uh, no. <laughs> but they were just like chocolate chip cookies. And we were going, oh, man, here it is. It satisfies. And this is how these bean pods are. This is how sin is, is when we just eat it and we're just unsatisfied. It does. We just, the more we eat, the more unsatisfied we are. Certainly this is what's going on here with this with this voice, he's, he's just sitting there eating these bean pods. And then he comes, he comes to his senses finally. He goes, hey, wait a minute. Enough. Verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men or literally hired servants. Now, certainly this is a major step forward for this young man. He's come to the end of the rope, and he's coming to his senses, but it's really only partial repentance because there was different types of servants, and he's already, in his mind, he's negotiating how he can still have some, some of his own independence. You see, they had bond servants then, or they were really like household servants, people that were really part of the family, they didn't even get paid. They were just part of the family. They just, they worked alongside the family. They were part of it. They went on family vacations. Then there was also kind of like day laborers. They would come in for the harvest. So two, three times a year, they would bring in some day laborers. They would help them, you know, take in the harvest. Then they wouldn't be seen again. Then there was the hired servants, the term he's using. Hired servants were people that lived maybe in a nearby town, and they would come each day to work from eight to four or five, then they would, they would go back to their house that they lived in. They would get paid weekly, but they still had their own independence. They still had all of their own autonomy. This is what he's thinking. He's going, hey, listen, I'm at I don't have anywhere else to go. Maybe my dad will bring me in, but I still don't want to live with the family rules. I still want to have things my way. So maybe I could strike up a deal with dad, you know, where he hires me, but I don't, 
I get all my independence. So this isn't full repentance. This is like, hey, I'm, I'm not ready. I'm, I'm in a tough spot. I need to be rescued, certainly. But I'm really not ready to come back and say, hey, I want to be part of the family again. And this is where we see this amazing effect of the Father's love and compassion. So God is a compassionate Father as he returns. It says, so the boy returns. He gets up. He decides to come back. It says in verse 21, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. Wow, that's a powerful word. See, the father could have had a lot of emotions. This is what's going on here. Filled with compassion, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. So here the father sees him a long way off. And he sees him and he's, it, does this look like a father who is angry at the son? Or is, no. And in those days, actually stories like this were actually pretty common. They would tell stories about kids that would do foolish things. You know, hey, I had a daughter that did this foolish thing, and they would tell the spin this little tale, and often they would tell bedtime stories. And they would, and, and they'd say, you know, they, they did something foolish, and then, you know, and, and then it was, it was terrible for them. And, it, and that, the story would always end there. And they, it basically was brainwashing the kids, saying, you ever do that? Don't ever come back, you know. <laughs> you know don't ever expect anything. And so here now Jesus has, is telling this audience, and here the father is responding with compassion. Well, this is not how this story is supposed to be told. See, for them, they would have just thought when, when he's telling the story, the father got up, he went and locked the gate. You know, no, but this isn't what we see. We see the father coming. You almost sense this father had, had longed for this day. You know, maybe he was just, he would just, each day he would walk around the house, go into his son's room, see that it was empty, you know, have, just his mind was filled with the memories of being with his son. He just longed to be with his son again. He prayed for him, waiting for him, hoping he would return. And then probably he's just maybe sitting outside the porch and just, you know, each day just wondering, you know, maybe will his son come home? And then, and then in the distance, he sees the silhouette of his son. And he's so excited, he, he stands up, and then he starts running. And in that day, elderly people did not run. Old people did. I mean, he would have to pick up his robe, and it's very undignified. You know, Jesus is telling the story. Nobody would even, it would almost be like sacrilegious to say, talk about God like this. Or even an older person. But God, but Jesus says it. He goes, no, this is, this is the heart that this guy has. Now, from the son's perspective, he sees his dad come, and he's thinking, dang, man, he's so ticked off at me. Look, he's running, and he's probably going to beat me up. I mean, he's, he, who, what, what is he thinking of? He drug their family name through the mud. They drug really the whole village through the mud. The villagers could have been very angry at him. That's probably why he had to leave. And now he's coming back, and maybe the villagers were picking up rocks. Because in that day, when you did this kind of, of, of offense, the punishment was stoning to death. And one thing they have a lot of in Israel is stones. So maybe they were all picking up stones, and the father saw that and thought, man, if I don't get to him fast, he's going to be dead. And so he ran and put his arms around him and said, hey, you're going to have to go through me to get to my son if you're going to try to kill my son. This is the amazing compassion that God has for those who have, who have walked away. You see, if when you're far from God, this is not generally the way we view God, is that he's longing for you to return. He can't wait for you to come back. That he's going to put his arms around you and, 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 and embrace you. But that is exactly what God does. And that's, for some of you, that's where you're at today. You've, you've acted foolishly. You've gone off and done something. You're on some distant country. And here you find yourself hearing about God's love and his compassion. And in just a moment, I'm going to call you home. I'm going to say, come home to the Father because that is how God will respond to you with love and with caring and with compassion. It's an amazing story. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. That word, those, that word kissed is not just like, an, like a little air kiss, a little peck. No, no, he just smothered him with kisses. Put his arms around him. And he just doesn't leave him like that. You know, now, you've got to remember, this kid just came from a pigsty. 
He could have just put his, went to put his arms around him and said, Woohoo! You smell, boy. Go take a shower. Then we'll go on with this thing, you know. No, he, you know, he hugs him and the kid's in tatters. He's filthy. But he doesn't leave him that way. Notice what he does is he says, I want to I take care of you. But God loves us. He cares about us. Uh, Jeremiah says, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. This is God's view. This is God's plan for you. As he says, I have a future and a hope. And now notice what he does. As he says, uh, the son said, Father, I have sinned. Now he goes right in to his little rehearsed speech, right? I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then he stops. He doesn't add that last part. He doesn't add the conditional part about being a hired servant, wanting his independence. No, he just says, you know, I've sinned, that's it. You see, this son came to the realization that it wasn't his father who was in the wrong. It wasn't the household rules that were messed up. It wasn't all of the regulations, all the obligations that he had to meet. No, it was, he goes, I have sinned. And friend, let me tell you, if you're going to come to God, those are the three words that you're going to need to be able to say is, I have sinned. You, there's a lot of people that'll get, that you can blame for the reasons you, you've made the decisions you've made. And certainly those are, those are influences. But when it comes to getting right with God, it says, Jesus says, the kid came and said, I've sinned. I've sinned. And then the father, notice how he responds. But the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his feet, finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. So here's the father's response. He says, bring a robe. This is a, fa- this is a sign of familyship. In other words, he's welcome back into the family. You're, you're one of us. He puts a ring on his finger, which is a sign of authority of the family. And then also shoes on his feet. Servants and slaves in those days didn't have shoes. Only free people had shoes. A lot like in, 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 back in the days in this country, back in the days of slavery, the despicable time in our country when there was slavery in Virginia and all around in our country, and, 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 and a lot of the slaves didn't have shoes. That's why there was a, a song that went, when we get to heaven, all God's children will have shoes. They'll get to have shoes. And so this is what he's saying is you get shoes because you're free. You're free. And he, he embraces him. And then they, he kills a fat calf. They start to celebrate. I mean, it's a party. It's a party. Jesus said at the beginning of verse 10 that the angels celebrate. There is no party like a party when somebody comes back home. God celebrates and he celebrates big. And so this is what's going on. And then we see this gr- God is a gracious father. Here's, there's another son. We learned about him at the very beginning. We haven't seen him until now. Now here's the elder son who has left. His younger son left with all the, 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 the state that was, the, the, his inheritance that was, that, that was going to go to him at some point. And now we meet him. He says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. He replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother was, became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a single young, even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because your brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. Now, if you read this story, sometimes people read this story and go, you know, the, the older brother's got a good point. I mean, I'm not sure I would go, listen, you do not want to be on the side of the older brother. I mean, 
Here he's coming in from the field and he hears music from a far way off. So you know it's not some guy playing guitar in the corner. I mean, they've got a full on, you know, bash going on. And live music, and except he goes up to one of the kids and says, what's going on here? Well, you know, your father, your, your brother's come home. And your, your father's killed a fatted calf. They're celebrating. You don't hear the father, the, the brother going, wow, that's, God is so good. I've been praying for him, and I've been concerned about him. No, he's, he's, he gets indignant. He's angry. Like, hey, you know, I'm, why, sh- why should he get anything? You know, this is, there's a danger that, that, that Jesus is pointing out. That sometimes we say, we look at other people that are in a real tough spot. Maybe they've messed up their life. And then they're in, they come to Christ and we go, good. They needed that. And then we're kind of have this holier than thou position, you know? It's kind of like, <laughs> I don't need all that. Or, you know, sometimes somebody who's sinned a lot and we're the ones who are the victims. We've been sinned against. We're not all that happy when they come to Christ. We're not all that happy about them at all. We don't give a rip what happens. To them. We just want them gone. Just leave. I never want to see you again. And that's not the attitude that we see the Father having. So God's grace is so good that one son who's, who squandered all of his inheritance that was owed to him comes back. He celebrates with him. He embraces him. He cleans him up. He gives him family authority again. But that same father's grace goes out to the son who's who's upset. He's angry because the the sin of this person has cost him a lot, has hurt him, has made his life more difficult. And God's grace goes out and sits with him as well and says, listen, you know, I'm with you as well. God's grace is big enough to meet everybody. And those really are kind of the two ends where we end up landing. Either one of us has just really been a fool, acted real stupid, which is most of us, and then there's some of us that we're just kind of stewing and brewing. We're not, we're not really ready for God's grace. And God is reaching out to you. His grace reaches out to you. Let's bow our heads and pray as we close this Easter service 2018, asking for God's amazing compassion to show up right now because there's some of you God is asking you to come home this is your day you may have been invited by somebody or you saw the sign or you got on the website or whatever reason however you ended up coming you might be joining us online you just dialed in and uh, we just appeared in your Facebook feed or for whatever reason you're you're listening to this message and God is reaching out to you. He says that he is not angry at you, but that he loves you and he runs towards you, that he has thoughts for you, a a future and a hope. Now, as I was praying about this service, I felt like God said some of you are in a very hopeless situation. I mean, you look at the situation you're in and truth be known, the enemy has somehow, somehow ripped out any remaining hope that was there. And now it's, it's empty. And you're, you're just sustaining. You're eating those bean pods that are, have no nutritional value. It's unsatisfied. And God wants to reach into your life, into your space. He wants to hug you, kiss you. He wants to lavish you with his love, fill you with purpose and, and hope again. Go, Andy, how do I get that? How do I, st- how do I experience that? Well, it begins, my friend, it begins with prayer. Just, you just right where you're at. We're not going to have you come forward. I, I know other churches do that. We're going to respect your space. But listen, we're between you and God right now, would you just, just dial into what God's saying and respond to him and pray those three words that the, this young man prayed. Say, Father, I have sinned. You just do that right now. Say, I have sinned. No excuses. I'm not going to blame anybody else anymore. I have sinned.
then would you say, God, I want to be in your family. Welcome me in. Would you say, God, I want the authority of the family. I understand there's the obligations that come with that. It does not mean about joining Vineyard Community Church. I'm talking about joining God's family, the, the, the spiritual family. There's a, you're entering in. When you, when you pray to receive Christ, you get birthed into a spiritual home. It's not like heaven someday. It's heaven now. A piece of heaven gets deposited into your soul. And you say, God, come, Lord. Cleanse me. Help me to make wise decisions. And you say, God, forgive me for the foolish things I've done. Today, Easter 2018, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. So I put my faith. Would you say, God, I, today I put my faith in, the, in, in you and in the work of Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.